listening to the Mindset Advantage podcast with Elliot Rowe and Dr. Tricia Gardner. Welcome to the Mindset Advantage podcast. Thanks to our sponsor, BBO Poker Tables. Check out their tables at bbopokertables.com. Now, Tricia, what do you have for us this week? Well, this week, I want to share a little bit of study that shows that napping is good for you. And specifically, an article came out in the journal Neurobiology of Learning and Memory. And they kind of did this complicated study where they were testing associative memory, which was the ability to remember the link between two items, which is not all that important. But they had people memorizing things. And then they could either one group either took a nap or the other group uh, watched a DVD for you know, the 45 to 60 minutes that the other people were napping. And then they had them recall what they had learned. And the result was that the nappers performed five times better than the DVD watchers. And also, just as an added bonus, they did brain scans. And those confirmed that the nap increased activity in the part of the brain that's linked to learning and memory. So now we know that cat naps actually improve your brain power. Not at the poker table, though. (laughs) So make sure you time them correctly. Um, Yeah, really good stuff. So um, let's go into um, part two of the interview with Olivier and um, see what he has to talk about. Now, another aspect that you talked about as being a problem back in the day uh, that I hear a lot about from my clients is the huge downswing. So what do you think is the best way to kind of get yourself through a huge downswing Well, that's hard. I mean, I have like a few things that I try to do. So first of all, I'm pretty precise with the way that I play. So when I start to deviate in terms of like actual plays that I'm making from the plays that I know or or say are pretty confident are good or the way that I want to play, then I know that the quality of my play is deteriorated or changed. Then I just, I try, I don't, I don't always succeed, but I try to stop and being able to stop is very important. And it has to do with a lot of different things. One of them is your ego because it feels like you're defeated when you stop. You know, when you continue playing and you're losing, you feel like, okay, I can keep playing, just get it back. You know, and people have this cognitive bias that when they lose, that they want to get back to zero. I'm reading this book on behavioral economics and it's, it's a concept that falls under the category of mental accounting. You know, they have this desire to erase losses because losses are about two times as painful as gains make you feel good. So people want to erase that bad feeling by kind of resetting the dial to zero. But another way to reset the dial to zero is to just stop. And then the next session you play, you're at zero. So being able to stop is very, very important. This is what I do. I have little things that just make me laugh or make me smile. And I just do those things. Music is huge for me. I really like comedy, stand-up comedy. I watch things that make me laugh. I just figure out a way to just shift my mind from losing to something that makes me feel good. And then just trying to constantly have a mental reset, just being like, it's a new session, it's a new day, and, you know, understand. You know, and I think studying is good because when you study, it's like it's almost like a shield of psychological armor because – as you study, you get more confident that the way you're playing is good. And I think that is a way to defend against some of the psychological aspects that come with you know, some of the, 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 the emotional downsides that come with losing. Because when people start to lose, they inevitably start to question themselves. They start to question whether they're playing well, whether people have improved too much or people have gotten too good, whether they've been kidding themselves, whether they were just winning because they were getting lucky, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are the, all of the mental games that people play with themselves. And so one way to kind of defend yourself against those creeping doubts is to just do some old fashioned work and reconvince yourself that the way you're playing is good and that if you kind of stick to it and ensure that the quality of your play remains high, that you will eventually kind of fade this bad luck and return to winning ways. And in terms of things, I, uh, something I hear a lot of like, guys will do is they'll drop down in stakes to try and rebuild their confidence back up. Is that something you recommend? Or is it, do you prefer to stay at the stakes you're at and just keep playing because you're confident that you're winning? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a player-by-player player decision and a bankroll-specific decision. If you're playing kind of thinly on your bankroll at the stakes that you're playing, 
then I think it's definitely a good idea to move down because yes, you can regain confidence and then also you just don't feel the pressure. But if you're rolled enough to play your games and it doesn't, it's not something that enters your mind or, or affects the way that you play, I think you just kind of got to have to make the decision for yourself. I think it definitely works for some people. I do it sometimes, but I do it also just because it's, it's just for me a way to minimize tilt. You know, like I would rather if I want to play and I'm not sure that the quality of my play is very high and I can't get myself to completely stop playing, I can go from playing a $5,000 heads up, sit and go to playing a $300 heads up, sit and go. And, you know, it just becomes much less painful, important, detrimental if I don't play well. All of those things, they just kind of, I've just kind of reduced the intensity. Now, some of our listeners are going to know you from your broadcasting work. How much mm -hmm. has doing broadcasting work helped your game or just kind of enlightened you? I think that, you know, doing broadcasting, I don't know how much it's actually helped my game. I think in general, one exercise that I used to do and that I still do sometimes but not as often is when I'm in a hand, I just kind of talk through the hand out loud talk through what I'm thinking, make sure that my thought process is sound and that, you know, I'm not kidding myself or trying to convince myself to make a play that's not backed by sound logic. And so I think that was an exercise that helped me be more comfortable broadcasting. But I don't think that broadcasting itself has actually helped my poker game that much. It might have made me more well-known and being well-known changes dynamics at live tables sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, because people like want to get you or some people are less likely to play hands with you. I mean, people just do weird things against people that are more well-known, but yeah, I, I don't think it's actually helped my understanding of, of poker, but I really enjoyed the broadcasting that I did. And I, it, I really enjoyed just the fact that I was able to be involved in poker and not be involved in a way that was playing where my decisions were, you know, where I felt so much pressure to play well and to win, where it was competitive. It was just I was able to, like, just watch and comment and hopefully entertain and educate a little bit and just have fun. So, I mean, I had a great experience doing broadcasting, but I'm not sure that it necessarily helped my game that much. And sort of on that theme of becoming well-known, uh, you currently have this fight organized <laughs> where you've bet over $100,000 against another poker player um, for a mixed martial arts cage fight. So... Obviously, the listeners will know how interested I'll be in this because it's, it's <laughs> half of what I talk about the whole time. So where did that decision come from and what led you down that path? So, yeah, so I have this prop bet. When I was growing up, I always – I don't think I'm alone as a young boy and a young guy who like wanted to like be tough and know how to fight. But that was always something that I thought was really cool and I really wanted to like learn how to do and do but never pursued it in any real way. I never took karate. I never took boxing classes. I never, you know, walked into a fight gym. I don't even, never even, didn't even know those existed. When I was in college, I used to drink a lot and had a lot of, I don't know, like repressed anger and used to get in fights. And I, again, always wanted to like know what I was doing, but I was just really more emotional and stupid than anything else. So this is like an interest that I've had, a personal interest that I've had. I think knowing how to defend yourself and knowing how to handle yourself in a physical situation is an important and, you know, I, I, I call it like basic skill that I've always wanted but never pursued. I had the idea. I was training at a gym, like just doing regular, you know, like fitness training, like whatever, weightlifting. And a trainer came up to me and started talking to me and I started working with him and he had done some MMA fighting and I was just had the idea of like him showing me some stuff. And that was that along with the fact that my closest friend, a guy that I met kind of recently is he's a purple belt in jujitsu and he's obsessed with UFC and he's obsessed with fighting. Those two guys kind of just sparked the idea in my head. So I just basically had an idea and I put it on Twitter. Sometimes I do that. I have thought and I put it on Twitter and then I regret it. And I'm like, why did I do that? Or, <laughs> <laughs> or, or I have an idea and I just like share it with everyone that follows me for some reason. So I was like, hey, I just wanted to essentially – I was just gauging interest. What I said in my tweet, I was like, I'm wondering if anybody wants to book a big bet to fight. You know, 
because uh, I was looking for essentially motivation to train. So I was looking for motivation to train, which means for me, like I didn't think that I had the internal motivation and discipline to follow to like do this thing. I didn't think I had it on my own. I thought that so it's the it. athletic equivalent to um, <laughs> your chat box blocking. In, in a way, yeah, in a way. <laughs> I, I just, yes, because I was creating an external mechanism that would force me into something that I knew I wanted to do but wasn't sure I could get myself to do. So in that sense, yes, it's analogous. But again, this was an idea I had, a very general and vague idea. It's not something I had thought through and not something that I was like sure that I wanted to do. I was just like, let me gauge interest and see what the response is. And I probably should have like expected this response because I knew that JC had had this bet with Andrew Robel. But like within five minutes of my tweet, like Steve O'Dwyer was like paging JC Alvarado. And then like I guess JC was sleeping and then when he woke up, he was like, hey, I haven't trained all year, but I'm interested. Let me know. And immediately I thought there was a chance that JC and I would be able to work out details one is one reason and very just simple reason is just because I know JC Alvarado. Like I don't, I'm not like friends with him or boys with him, but like I know who he is, you know, I've met him, I've played with him. Like he's a known quantity. So I think just from that point of view, like that's better, you know, than just like fighting someone who's involved in poker, but I don't know it all. That's just a much more dicey proposition. And then I also know JC and I know he's not like a huge guy. So, you know, my initial thoughts about fighting was I bit like, let's just say I underestimated how technically intensive fighting is. And I think that's not all that surprising, I'm sure, to you, Elliot, that like most people don't realize just how much. Yeah, it, it was a surprise to see it on Twitter initially. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not the easiest thing to, to learn. So, you right. know, you really have to dedicate yourself to um and it is something, you know, when you first when you first fight with someone, you know, who's a trained kickboxer or a high level jujitsu fighter, it can be a bit of a shock to the system, I think, to say the least. <laughs> I found when I was starting out anyway, all those years ago. Right, right. So like so when I started talking to JC, like I didn't know I knew JC, but I didn't know that he was like as obsessed and crazy about the sport that he is. Like I knew he had had this bet, but I didn't know that like I didn't follow him on Twitter, so I didn't, you know, like when you you know, I follow him now and it's like 90% of his tweets are like USC or MMA related. It's like part of his like Twitter background. It's like clearly this is something that he's been like very kind of into and obsessed with for like a long time. So that was apparent in like the beginning of our negotiating. I did like I never even really watched the USC. I didn't like know shit about MMA and he like knew everything and there was this like real imbalance in our knowledge and I was a little hesitant to like kind of book a bet and get involved in like a potential fight with someone where this imbalance existed. So for the first, for like a couple of weeks, I was like, not sure I wanted to do this. So my friend's name is Joe and Joe is the, the kid I was talking about who's a pro belt and, and he like does boxing and he's just like, he's obsessed with the UFC a little bit like JC is maybe a little less, but we were just talking. And when I told him about this idea, he like got so excited. He was like, he was like, okay. So I was just like, oh shit. Okay. So then he helped me kind of figure out what questions to ask, what things to make sure. So like, you know, the fact that JC had never actually fought before was like really important. The fact that he didn't have, let's say, like a wrestling background was also something that I felt more comfortable with. And then I was able to negotiate a pretty significant weight difference, which I thought could be important. And then, you know, I felt like my read of the situation was that there was an athleticism gap between us, maybe not a huge one. But at least like, let's say like one level, like I think my read is that JC is probably around like a pretty good high school athlete. And I think my athletic ability is probably like a division three college athlete. So I think that's a difference. And my guess was that that difference would be relevant in two ways. There would be a multiplier effect in terms of the training so that I would accelerate uh, faster. And then in the fight itself, being athletic seemed like it would help. So those things made me somewhat confident that I could do this. But the real thing that happened to me was when this idea turned into a potential reality, I had, not surprising for me, but I had an emotional reaction. And that emotional reaction was fear. I felt afraid 
not even in this obviously rational way, like, well, yeah, it's a fight. Obviously, you're going to be afraid. But I felt this, like, irrational cloud of anxiety. And it was, like, hanging over me. And it really made me not want to do it. This was at a time where my divorce was, like, being finalized, so just, like, very fresh. My family, like, my immediate family was desperate to convince me not to do this. And I felt like I was in – I was, like, at a crossroads. And, like, in one direction was essentially the easy way, like – just give in to my family, give in to this fear and just be like, oh, you know what? This was an idea. I have thought about it and decided that I don't want to do it. Thanks anyway. And then just drop it. And I felt like I could have very easily done that and just moved on. But I think a combination of the fact that my divorce was relatively recent and I was in this mode of like refiguring out who I was and trying to set a new path and uh, forge a new sense of myself. You know, my wife was like my closest friend by a long shot. So when that relationship ended, I felt very lost. And I knew that I needed to just help myself figure out a new path. But I was able to gain some perspective. And I was just like, you know, are you going to be the guy that just gives in to this fear? Or are you going to be the guy that just tries to face it and overcome it? And when I gained that perspective and when I viewed it in those terms, then I was like, oh, well, okay, now I don't really have a choice. <laughs> like, oh, well, <laughs> now when you put it that way, now you kind of have to do it. That was my reaction. So I was just like, I went to my friend Joe and I said, look, what other questions do I need to ask this guy? Because I'm, I'm going to do this. And so we like went over it and I asked him and his answers were acceptable. And I was just like, I like just wrote him a thing and I was like, okay, let's like, these are my terms. And he just like accepted them. And I was really happy that he accepted them because I felt like they were pretty favorable for me. But I knew that JC like really wanted to do this. You know, like I think his experience with Andrew Robel not turning into an actual fight, I think was a considerable letdown for him because, you know, he's so into this thing and he really wanted to have this experience, obviously, and wasn't able to. So now the opportunity to have it, I think he really, really wanted to do it. I think he was a little exasperated with the fact that I didn't really know much about this and I was taking some time to negotiate. So when he got when he got an opportunity to just say yes and have it set, he just took it. Um, so I, I, I think I was able to negotiate decent terms for myself. So I'm going to weigh in at 187.5. He's going to weigh in at 165. So that's 22 and a half pounds, yeah. And people think that's weird, that like very specific number. The, the reason that was was just because I was essentially splitting the difference of a negotiation between 20 and 25. So I just got to 22 and a half. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's laying me like a, a little, a small price, right? So I'm putting up 120, he's putting up 150. So I thought those terms were, were pretty good. And, you know, I, got, I was given six months to train. Obviously, not just me, we were given six months to train. But since I had had no training, they were particularly important for me. So, yeah, so we're about a little over two months away now. So without giving away, because I know you're not going to give away any of your training plan, how challenging psychologically has it been to do the training? Can you speak to that or is that? Yeah. Kind of, okay. Sure. I mean, that, that, this was also part of the reason that I wanted to do this, this project. I call it a project because, you know, as a poker player, my life is a lot of whatever I want it to be. You know, when I compare it to the lives of let's like my friends or even like my family, you know, they almost always work for someone else. You know, they have to they have an alarm clock. They have to wake up at a certain time. They have to go to work. They have to wear a certain thing. You know, even even, you know, just the in the professional world, you have to speak a certain way. You have to you have to have a certain professionalism to you. you there's there's just all things that, you know, you just like you can't just do whatever you want to do. Whereas when you play poker for a living, you can pretty much just do whatever you want to do. You can play whenever you want. You can play whatever tournaments you want. You can go to the stops that you want. It's just completely kind of up to you. And I think what a lot of people develop and what I specifically developed was this, I don't want to say inability, but this like, you know, I like, I didn't develop this willingness to like do things that I didn't want to do, um, which I, in, in a way is just like a form of discipline. And so I wanted to do this as a way to, especially as I anticipate exiting the poker world in some hopefully sooner rather than later time, 
I wanted to start the process of developing like a real discipline. And the training is very difficult and not something that I particularly enjoy. And so I think it's been really good for me to force me to just do it, to just not really feel like I have a choice and just do it. I think I've been pretty good about it. And I, there are some ways that I've been very fortunate. But, you know, again, this was part of the point of this project was to try to develop that discipline. So, you know, I, I also wanted to try to create an environment or a scenario where if I lost the fight, I wouldn't feel like this was all for nothing. So if I develop some basic hand-to-hand -hand combat skills, if I get to a very high level of fitness, and if I develop some discipline and then lose the fight and lose the money, I still won't feel like this was a complete waste of time and a disaster. And so creating a scenario where, you know, with, where the outcomes are either incredible success, you know, thrill and like, you know, obviously winning is going to be great. I don't really have to go into that. And then the, the flip side still isn't that bad because I've still managed to do some good things and, and develop some things that I think are important for me. I think I've created a good scenario for myself. So that was, that was also part of the idea. Now, I do want to ask you what I ask. We had Terrence Chan on the show. And as yeah. you probably know, he's in MMA. And also he loves Tim Ferriss. So I kind of borrowed this from uh, something Tim Ferriss likes to ask. But I asked Terrence and I ask you, who is the most punchable person in poker? Um, I mean, it's hard for me to say anybody <laughs> except for JC Alvarado. <laughs> I've been, uh, I heard that JC was using visualization techniques. And so I, I thought maybe that I would use some of my own and in all of my techniques, it's, it's his face that's being punched beyond that. I don't know, maybe like myself, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I try to direct all of my aggression and anger and desire for physical harm, like within the context of my training and within this fight. So I, I don't, I don't want to fight anybody in poker besides JC. Not yet. <laughs> Maybe later, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and you know, Terrence was actually like an integral part of our, of our like setting of terms. He like really helped us um, try to figure out like what made sense. Terrence was very, very like uh, helpful and great. I had, we had a, I had a really good experience dealing with him. Excellent. And do you have a date set yet or do you have a rough time scale? Yeah, so this has been like a little bit of an issue. Neither JC or I have been able to pin down any specific details. My guess, you know, John Jones Cormier fight in at the MGM like in April. My best guess is that it will be that week also in Vegas. So like maybe the Thursday or Friday before that fight. We're thinking about doing something somewhat similar in setup to the way Sorrell and Brian Rast uh, did their boxing match. But we unfortunately do not have details yet. I'm going to try and use the next week or two to truly pin down some some details. I, I have a way to do it in New York, but JC didn't really like that idea, I guess, because of like, you know, home court advantage type stuff. So we have to still figure out some details. But my guess is around April 20th and potentially in Las Vegas. Sounds like I might fly out to Vegas and watch a UFC and do fine. <laughs> <laughs> what a good excuse. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, well, well, thanks so much for coming on the show. Really good to hear about the poker side. And then, you know, the, the mixed martial arts as well, as I say, it works really well. We deal with both on the show. So having you crossing over is just excellent from that side. So really appreciate it. And where can people find you on Twitter so that they can follow the run up to the fight and then possibly watch the videos and things once it does happen? So my Twitter handle is just my full name at Olivier Bousquet. If people start to follow me, they'll see that my profile picture is an unfortunate incident that happened from training. But that's what happens, I guess. Those are the breaks, you know. And also, you have a chapter in Excelling at No Limit Hold'em if people want to read your yes, thoughts. Yes, do. Yes. yes, that's true. This, it was a great project that we were involved in with the guy who never ceases to stop writing books and stop working, <laughs> Jonathan Little. He's really just, yeah, he's, he's <laughs> unbelievable. I have such respect for him. So yeah, check that book out. Um, there's a bunch of great chapters that we've all contributed. And I think it's a, it's a, it was a great project by Jonathan to, to help us come together. Absolutely. Okay, well, perfect. Well, as I say, thanks so much for coming on the show and um, I'll talk to you soon. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you guys for having me. Bye. Bye. So it was really great to have Olivier on the show. 
It was good of him to give us a full hour of his time talking over what the high stakes world is like, the realities of it now. And then that obviously that huge prop bet that he's taken on for the MMA fight. Well, I'll tell you what, I thought he offered a lot of nuggets of wisdom that people can use. But one thing I wrote down is he may not have thought he was doing it, but I felt like he gave an equation for, you know, tilt, which is, you know, you have huge downswings. Maybe you're not even very good. Your skill level is not what it needs to be. And you have a propensity towards, you know, maybe some emotionality that can equal massive tilt problems. Yeah, it's usually a combination of factors. And um, obviously, we need to work on all of those parts. So reducing the emotion, as well, improving the skill level as well, and making sure that you're winning in the games to resolve those issues and ensure that you can play your A game more frequently. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, just everything that he had to say about tilt and the things that he utilizes, you know, whether it be an external control or whether it be, you know, increasing your self-awareness, increasing your emotional intelligence. He even went so far as to talk about seeing a therapist because tilt, you know, was related to some deeper issues. So clearly he understands, you know, the effect that tilt can have and that you really have to go that extra mile to solve the problem sometimes. And I mean, obviously, everyone knows my thoughts there. You know, I, I'm a very strong believer that lots of tilt is caused by very deep emotional issues. And if you do resolve them in some form of therapy, you can see very substantial gains at the poker table. So Elliot, you have the fighting background for listeners who don't know. Elliot did a little MMA in his time. Long time so, ago. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think about this upcoming fight? Yeah, you know? it's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun. I, I have to see if I can uh, get the weekend away from the family and I'll fly <laughs> out to Vegas and watch the UFC and go and watch their fight if they manage to do it that same weekend. It's going to be very interesting. JC has the um, more experience in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Olivier has that big weight advantage. So um, yeah, it's going to be a very exciting fight and um, I'll obviously be cheering for Olivier there. So um, you'll see me shouting very loudly <laughs> at the side of the cage. <laughs> now, just for point of reference, how good can somebody get with six months training? Somebody who's going from zero like Olivier, you know, what can he do in the six months? Six months is enough to actually get relatively proficient if you take it very seriously, if you treat it like a job. So it just depends how seriously Olivia has taken it. Obviously, you can't catch up years and years of training, but the weight advantage may may turn out to be very significant there. So we'll just have to see, yeah, just see how Olivier comes into the cage and what he's managed to learn. It's just so difficult to know um, what levels they'll both be at with this six month of training and just seeing how hard the guys have, have really gone for it. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be pretty interesting. Yeah, it'll be a lot of fun. So I'm um, looking forward to that one. So remember, guys, Olivier said it best. As a poker player, your life is whatever you want it to be. And so if you want to do things like train for an MMA fight or start a business or whatever on the side, you can certainly do that. Yeah, make the most of the freedom. Most people in life do not have anything like the freedom that poker can give you. So you may as well have some fun. Go and challenge someone to a fight. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, excellent. And um, Trisha, where can people find out about you and your products? You can follow me on Twitter at Dr. Trisha Cardner, or you can check out my website, drtrishacardner.com. And um, from my side, if you're interested in my coaching and my products, so uh, head to pokermindcoach.com. Um, we'll see you next time. And we're going to be having your doom on next time. He's a well-known poker coach. And he's going to be talking about his philosophies and the way that he looks at poker. So I um, hope to see you all next time. Bye, guys. You've been listening to the Mindset Advantage podcast with Elliot Rowe and Dr. Trisha Gardner. To get any resources mentioned in the episode or to listen to past shows, visit pokermindcoach.com forward slash TMA podcast. Thanks for listening. 